Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Seekers of the Supernatural. I'm your moderator, Tony Sparrow, tonight along with Ed Warren and Lorraine Warren, your hosts. Tonight, we're going to speak about a show that I'll bet you everybody in the audience, bar none, knows about. It's a show about a place in Long Island, Amityville, Long Island. Probably the most famous case ever investigated by Ed and Lorraine Warren. And you know, to this day, we have people come up to Ed, to Lorraine, and ask them if Amityville was a hoax. They'll come up and say things like, I knew someone who was in that house. That was a hoax. There's no such thing as ghosts at Amityville. I got to tell you, I know it was not a hoax. Ed Warren will tell you, Lorraine will tell you, that that house was one of the most haunted locations in all of America back in 1974, 75. So, with that, I think we'll start the program by asking Ed and Lorraine how they started out with Amityville, how, did they, how they got involved. So, Ed, can you please tell us how you got involved the first instance? Yes. Yeah. Well, of course, we were called by uh, Marvin Scott, who was the anchorman for Channel 5 at the time. But we had met Marvin about a year earlier at a haunted church in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And he was impressed by our investigation, and we had not heard about the killings in Amityville because Lorraine and I were out of the country at the time. And when he asked us to go there because six members of a family were murdered, and then a little over a year later, another family moved in. And this family fled the house after 28 days. Well, of course, this interest, interested both of us. So we went to the uh, Amityville home. We met Marvin Scott with a camera crew. And uh, we were supposed to meet George Lutz, who was going to let us in the house. But George wasn't there. And he made a phone call. And uh, George Lutz said, the closest I'll come to that house is four blocks away. I'll give you the keys at a pizza parlor nearby. Well, we went there. We met George. He gave us the keys. And I'll never forget it. He was sitting as close to me as you are. And I said, remember now, this is the first time I've ever seen the guy. Mr. Lutz, what happened to you in that house? Because I really didn't know what happened. And he just looked at me and he said, you know, just like oh. that. I said, no, I don't know. And I said, what happened to you in, in the house that you were so frightened that your family and yourself fled out of there? Mm -hmm. You know. That's all now he I was getting a little saying. sick of this. I said, I don't know, I'm not a clairvoyant, I'm not a medium, I'm an investigator. And I thought to myself, this guy doesn't even want to talk about it. Is he that scared of it? Well, I found out that he was afraid to talk about it. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to give a recognition. Right. Well, we took the keys, we went to the house. Now, as I just said, I'm not a clairvoyant, I'm not a sensitive. But when I opened up that door and walked in that house, it reeked of death. Not just because of the six people who were murdered, the DeFeos, mother, father, two sisters, and two brothers. And this all occurred on November 13th, 1974, at 3.15 in the morning. Every member of the family was found shot to death, all lying on their stomach, Tony. Now, we'll get into that during the program, but that in itself was unnatural. The police had felt they were drugged. They were not drugged, and they found that out during the autopsy. Mm -hmm. We walked into that house, and <clears throat> it's my custom, Tony, to go down into the cellar, the lowest part of the house. These are usually the darkest areas. This is where evil thrives. This is where it survives. It hates God's light. It hates the sunlight. It hates any kind of light. So while Lorraine was walking up the stairs with the camera crew, I went down into the cellar. It was a huge place. We'll show pictures of it later. And uh, as is my custom as a religious demonologist, I took out a crucifix, I held it up, and I commanded in the name of Jesus Christ and the blood of Christ what was there to reveal itself. It wasted no time. I never had such a quick reaction, Tony. I felt as though I was underneath a waterfall. That's how, how terrific the pressure was on my head and shoulders, forcing me down to the floor. 
Then I felt what I can only describe as hundreds of pinpoints of electricity hitting my body. And as though somebody had taken a hot towel and dropped it over my face, I couldn't breathe. I knew what was happening immediately. I felt it before, but not to that extent. Mm -hmm. I immediately went into what we call religious resistance, which means that I again commanded in the name of Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ, what was there, to leave and go back to where it came from. Immediately it lifted off. I went up the stairs to where Lorraine and the camera crew were, and she'll tell you what she felt there. Well, now I had no way of knowing, Tony, since I was walk they asked me to go up onto the next floor. Mm -hmm. I had just left walking all around on the first floor. And it's in that one room, that wet bar room, the room that you see on the very front of the house that I stood and could see all of these bodies all lined up. Mm -hmm. Clear visually. Clear visually, I could see that. That's where the DeFeos were prior to being taken out you know, to the morgue. And that was, that was horribly disturbing. And I remember I took that relic of Padre Pio, which mm -hmm. no camera person knew I had, and I cupped it in my hands and I, I prayed, mm -hmm. you know, to him. Right. Now that is the room where the image of him, Padre Pio, it was, was picked probably, up on probably film. Just, we probably have a slide of this. Yeah, time. we're gonna have a slide of it, Tom. Now at this point, I'm still on camera, so I'm not looking. I just think Ed is with me, that he is somehow behind the cameras and that he is there. And I start to go up the stairs. Mm -hmm. Never did I know that he went downstairs. I did not know that. I started to go up to the first landing where the great big window is. And as I did, it felt as if I was standing right under on rushing water and it bothers you it, it's a pressure that's on your body to such a what great extent. What happens is that the uh, atmosphere actually solidifies in homes like this. It's like trying to penetrate a wall of cement really. So I got up and I made it up to that landing and again I cupped that relic of Padre Pio and asked for mm -hmm. his help, his right. guidance, his and made it up the rest of the way. When I got up to the top of the stairs, remember I'd never been in this home, I knew nothing about anything about it, nothing about the history at all, Tony. It was just another haunted house, mm -hmm. except that we were on camera. I went to the left and went in this room that was the sewing room. Right. And in that room, I looked at Marvin Scott and he told me, just a year ago, that he will never forget what I said to him, and that is, I hope this is as close to hell as I'll ever get. Wow. And in that room is where Father Pecoraro was told by an unseen voice to get out. Mm -hmm. It's the room where the hundreds of flies were killed. That's all. He was also that slapped in the face at that time. Yes. Which a lot of people don't know. They think that uh, the voice was the only thing he heard. After he heard the voice, he felt a physical slap in the face. He told me this himself. He repeated it to reporters. It's on official file. There's mm -hmm. no two ways about it. No. People have said, there never was a Father Pecoraro. And we couldn't even mention his name no. for the first two years wow. until we got permission to do it. Now, a lot of people out there have heard <clears throat> the Amityville horror is a hoax. Why do you think that is? because the atheists want you to think it's a hoax. They don't want anyone out there to believe for one second that a home like in Amityville could be haunted by diabolical forces, which it was. Mm -hmm. Their aim is to kill any belief that you have mm -hmm. because if you believe that there's such a place as Amityville and a horror that was in that home, you might believe in a supernatural God. Right. They don't want that. No. You might believe in a devil they don't want that either because a skeptical public is the best protection that devils have. And devils mm -hmm. do exist. Mm -hmm. Demons do exist. And 25 years ago, just like I, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, when we went in on the Lindley Street case, uh, 966 Lindley, I offered a $3,000 reward to anybody, and I'm offering it again. 
anybody out there that can come to me and prove, the first person comes to me and proves that the uh, case in, on Lindley Street was a hoax, I'll give them $3,000. Anybody that can come to me, the first one, comes to me and proves that there was a hoax committed by the Lutzes, ourselves, Prentice Hall, the priest, and anybody else mm -hmm. in Amityville, I will give them $3,000. Nobody has ever come to collect that money because both of these cases were very genuine and both of them made international headlines. This is what the atheistic community hates. They don't want you people to believe out there that such things as devils exist. And even the church today is, is tight-lipped about what's going on. Mm -hmm. What's going on with the church? That's what I want to know. Right. Now, I know we have some slides that we're going to set up uh, mm -hmm. But while we're setting up the slides, Lorraine, and getting that all set, mm -hmm. um, what was your f sense in the house? How did you feel in that house right. during the investigation? My, my immediate reaction, Tony, when I walked in was terrible depression. Mm -hmm. You're in a home where so many people had died yeah. violently. Then an, a young family had moved in mm -hmm. and they fled, leaving everything. You look all over, Tony, and you're, it's like you're in somebody's home that they just walked out of or going to the store and they're coming back. And it's, it was just overwhelming feeling everything, of depression. Everything was intact. Everything. Uh -huh. Clothing in, in the closets, the dishes, the pans, cookware, everything you could, just like you have in your home right now. Mm -hmm. They left it. They wouldn't take one thing because... The priest told them not to take anything out of there with them. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, he told them not to take it. I think the slides are almost ready. Now, if we can go to the slides, Ed, did you want to talk and tell us what we're sure. seeing on the slides? Yeah. Um, I think we're going to go to the first one now. As soon as we get to camera one, well, uh, I think it's just going to be a slide of the... Okay, uh, That's that, it. of course, is a sign of Amityville. And Amityville means friendly village, you know. Oh, it does? <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's... And do you know what the... Uh, Latitude of that is? No. 40.666. Really? 40.666. Oh, right boy. where the house is. Oh. Mm -hmm. Next. Okay, that's, that's the, the house as it looked at the time of our investigation, of course. Mm -hmm. Now it's been changed around. Oh, yeah. I guess the people or uh, the guy that owns it doesn't want to be bothered, and I don't blame them, because there are vandals who create a lot of nuisance. But you see, where that car is parked, People Magazine reporters also parked their car there. The Camardi family, who bought the house after the Lutzes fled, from what I understand, there was a deal made with American International Pictures to sell that house for $250,000 to them so they could use it in a movie which was to be made. Well, of course, American International Pictures was not allowed to film there, because of the town fathers or the neighbors, and they got stuck with a pig and a poke. And they claimed that it was a beautiful house, nothing ever happened to that house, there was nothing but good feelings in there. How could you have good feelings in a house where six people were murdered yeah, and five people fled? How could you have good feelings? You couldn't. No. But they got into that car there, their car, it burst into flames. When they were walking around in the house, they could smell this foul odor. And they said to Mrs. Cromarty, what's that stench that we smell? Oh, I dropped coffee on the rug about a week ago. You should never drink that kind of coffee, believe me. <laughs> no. What's the next slide we have, Ed? What's George and Kathy Lutz. George now, not Kathy. too many people have seen photographs of George and Kathy. You look at that guy. Does he look like the kind of a guy that would run away from nothing? Does he look like some kind of a wimp? No, he does not. Mm -mm. And this man and his wife had spent all of their down payment that they got from Kathy's home that she sold and money he had from his business, put it into that house. 28 days later, they're going to flee that and leave everything behind with all their earthly belongings? Oh, right, this guy was an ex-Marine. He was a black belt in karate. He hung around with motorcycle gangs. Hey, this guy doesn't run easy, he believe me. He doesn't scare easily. No, no way. he doesn't scare easily. There's George, happier That's days when they first moved in. They bought the house, you know, on the Amityville River for $50,000. Pretty good price. Right? <laughs> that was Actually, some buy. Was that a lot of money back then, though? It had a pool? No, oh, that, yes. It was? No, no, no. It wasn't a lot. No, you, you mean this, uh, to buy a house on the river? Oh, no, Tony. It probably should have been more. Who would buy a house? Who, except George said, 
When the dead are dead, that's it. They don't bother you. I mean, it was a lot of money, Tony, but it but wasn't enough absorbent. for that house. Yeah, because you know? it had everything. George was an atheist, you know. Yeah. Today he's a devout Catholic. Oh. He's a, he's, he uh, attends church daily and his that's, wife. There's Kathy. There's Kathy in happier days. She was a waitress at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, this was to be their dream house. You know, right. this is what they saved for. This is what they wanted. Right. They were newly married. The three children, of course, were Kathy's, but George uh, treated them like his own children. Oh, oh he did. He was very good to the children. And yeah. there's statues. Now, here's, here's my argument right here, ladies and gentlemen. Look at those statues. You know where they came from? Nope. Montreal, Canada, from yeah. St. Joseph's Shrine. Okay, okay, I heard of that. Mr. DeFeo, who was murdered, the man that was murdered in that house with his family, went six months before he was murdered up to Montreal, Canada, brought back a priest who was an exorcist to exorcise that home. Now, if that house wasn't haunted, why did he go up and get an exorcist? Why did he bring him back before the Lutzes ever lived there? Because that house was haunted. Yep. And those statues were specially made for him to surround this house with. And people said, what, what's this with Mr. DeFeo? He's not a religious person. What's all the statues? He said he had a, 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 a devil, devil on, on his, his back. back. <coughs> now, what he was talking about, of course, was his son. Yeah. His son, who he felt did probably come under oppression and possession at times, was into the black arts, was on drugs, and who eventually murdered every one of them. So that's what those statues were about. Okay, next. And here there you have is. the look, Amityville River. Look at that property. Okay, look at the boathouse. There's the house in the background. $50,000, ladies and gentlemen. That'd be like $500,000. That's more right. Than that. More oh, than yeah. that. On the Amityville oh, River. Yeah. But look at the boathouse. That's, that's where the boathouse in the background. The an Indian tribe had kept prisoners, dying prisoners, went mad, starving. And, you know, tragedies like this draw inhuman or diabolical spirits. Mm -hmm. because they love to see human misery, human tragedy. And I believe that's where it all started. But George also had a brand new uh, boat in there, brand new, with $500 worth of tools that he oh. left behind. Mm -hmm. And his motorcycles. Two motorcycles, custom made. Mm -hmm. wow. A man like that doesn't leave all that behind. No, absolutely not. No. Look at how, kitchen, look how right? it looked, Tony. That's the In other words, the plants are there where she had watered them and left them on the counter yep. to drain. Mm -hmm. The dishes from supper are right in the sink. Wow. The, the they were just like that when you went in there. Yes, exactly. Later. Just exactly that way, Tony. They yeah. fled that house. Oh, yeah. They were just, frightened. Just exactly We've that seen way. Hundreds of other people just like them. This is nothing new to Lorraine and I. You know, for every Amityville that gets publicized, like the Smurl family, the um, Gooden family, there's 500 that never reached the public. Oh, yeah. So this here is not unusual to and see homes Tony, like this flood. I remember these bolts of material. Now, who, who's that in the middle, me? That's Jim Brolin. I know, I know. I yeah, that. that's James J Brolin. That's and that's you, and who is his wife next to him? No, that's uh, a girl that he had just met, and they were dating at that time. He was leaving, we were leaving that day for Australia, Ed and I, and he was leaving the next day, and he wanted so bad to go with us, but they couldn't change the flights. Well, you know what he told us? He would go over to the Amityville home, he'd park out in front, and he'd look at the house and he thought, I'd like to go over and knock on the door and see if I get in. But then again, he said, no, I'm not going in there. Really? He wouldn't go in because he was frightened. He was, uh, yeah, he didn't want to subject himself to that. What a wonderful nice person guy. he was. He's a nice guy. Oh, nice, nice person. Really like, nice like guy. Him. Very, very nice guy. Now, what's that? Now, uh, that's the two cameramen camera that came in. Both of these men knew combat assignments, Tony, both of them. They had such severe heart palpitations. Most of the that, men did. In that house that they got down on their knees on the floor in, in the house. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was just unbelievable. Do you know, Tony, that all of the men, all of the men, men, not women, yeah. all of the men mm -hmm. going into that house have all died of heart-related problems. Except Ed. And Ed had a heart attack right, you know, sometime after going in the house. Now these... Well, no, not all of the men, Lorraine. You yes, they did. Kaplan's still alive, isn't he? The one no. That what was his name? Marvin not Scott. Kaplan. Scott. Marvin Scott, Scott. Scott yeah, alive. Marvin Scott is still alive. But the principal people involved in the but investigation... But most of them are dead. Yes, most okay. of them are dead of a heart attack. Because 
It's the media that did that check for us. That's Marvin Scott right there, that's isn't it? That's Marvin front? Scott right there. Uh -oh. That's Dr. Brian Riley sitting next to me, a parapsychologist from England. That's his wife, Alberta, uh, that you can see just behind Marvin. That's during the period of time of, of um, the communication in that house. That was a horribly dangerous home. Now, this is Dr. Carlos Osis, president of the American Society for Psychic Research. Dr. Alex Tanis, they're talking to Ed and I. In the background are people from Duke University. These are the people that we brought in. We are the investigators of the Amityville Horror. That handful of people, Tony. The media, that's it, huh? that's it, that's all. And people came out of the woodwork after reading a book, making all sorts of statements regarding the fact that was hoaxed, based on a book, based on a piece of literary property, they're saying that the case was a hoax, not based on an investigation. And this is Marvin Scott That's again. That's Marvin again oh, with Alberta. But look at the silverware in back of Marvin Scott. Look at the, right. them look at all the valuable china in the uh, uh, china closet yeah. there. And uh, what kind of dishes are on the, on the wall there? I, 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 can't see I what forget they are, what they, they were, but they it was a collector. Everybody. They left everything they had. Yes, they were collector items. Now, the man who is on our right and on the right on the looking screen, over shoulder. Uh, looking over my shoulder, he was very badly affected in that house. And he was from he, Duke. Duke. And he collapsed, Tony, and had to be taken out. The man in the middle has died of a heart attack. Really? Yes. Oh, boy. Yes, he had died of a heart attack. Now, are you, uh, this is Missy's bedroom. Are you aware that the children and George and Kathy slept in the very beds that the DeFeos were murdered I in? I heard that, yeah. The only yeah. thing changed were the mattresses. That is the furniture of the little girls, and that's the room uh, where Missy slept. But look now, at the rocking chair. George and Kathy would hear that a voice coming, and they'd peek in through that door over on the right. And they see that rocking chair going back and forth or by itself. Nobody in it. Nobody in it. And, and the they'd come girl. in and see what they described as red eyes looking in through the window over there. And they, the little girl would talk to that. Now, th this man is, was one of the parapsychologists uh, with the group, Jerry Salfin. He is, now has his doctorate in parapsychology and as far as I know, is still at John F. Kennedy University. Okay. Uh, that, see where the sign is, where it was, had the sign there? The pole, Tony, yeah. the sign, the pole, the sign read, High Hopes. Is what? it? Yes, you how see sad. Where the, you see where the, uh, the uh, boathouse is down there? Yeah. One night, George, Kathy, and the three children were watching television. They looked out the window there, and they could see again the red eyes that they described as Jody the Pig. He ran out, George. He looked, and it was snowing lightly. And he could see footprints, hoofprints, leading down to the boathouse. Mm -hmm. He went down there, and the door was damaged, as if somebody had smashed into it. Now, people said, well, there was no snow called for that night. The Weather Bureau didn't call for snow. <laughs> the Weather Bureau is never wrong, are they? <laughs> but did you ever see it snow on one side of the town and not on the other side? Sure. Yes, sure. positively. So they picked on little things like little this. Little things, they grabbed it. Yes. Uh, again, these are shots. Oh, there's the master bedroom. Now, there's the bed where Mr. and Mrs. DeFeo were shot to death in. And to sit on that bed, Tony, was absolutely horrible. I sat on the edge of the bed in that room. Yes. There's the red room, the so-called red room. And that's where he kept. A lot Who's of he? the tools. But the, the red room, uh, Ronald DeFeo? Ronald DeFeo. The Defeo. red room, as they call it, though, was it's nothing more than a cubby hole. Under it the went stairs. In, it was about maybe eight feet long by four foot wide. But this is where he kept a lot of the things that he used he in used black in his magic. craft, yes. That's where he kept them. Uh, that's myself talking with Dr. Carlos Osis and Alex Tanis, who told, uh, Alex told Ed that afternoon, that he came up against the most powerful evil force he ever felt. Well, Alex Tannis well, look looks, at, like, look a, at his looks face. like a devil to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Alex, yes. Alex looks like the devil is still in him. He, he, he looks like he's going to bite into my neck, doesn't he? what's this shot of? The sewing it? room? This is the sewing room, Tony. There's the room where I looked at Marvin Scott 
and said, I hope this is as close to hell as I'll ever get. Yeah, and that's the room where the priest had told Next. the voice told him to get out Can I watch this? and was slapped in the face. This we only got three minutes left, so I want to get more of these slides Oh, in. yeah. All right. And this is what taken going up the stairs. You know what I'd like you to spend the three minutes on, Tony? That polygraph test. You would? Yes. Yeah. That's very, very important. Right okay, this so what we'll do is we'll uh, shut off the uh, slides, and then we'll go to, uh, I have this, um, now, this is a document. This is a document. You want to explain it? You want to yes. explain it? This is a uh, document from Mr. Chris Gugas, who was president of the Polygraph Association of America at the time of the hauntings in the home in Amityville. He had tested both Mr. and Mrs. Lutz and another polygraph expert. And here is the results. Okay. I'm going to read this. This is, uh, this is by the Professional Security Consultants. Okay, here it is. Regarding George and Kathy Lutz, dear Mr. Moses, on June 19, 1979, a polygraph examination was conducted on George and Kathleen Lutz at this office. The issues to be res resolved concerned events which took place at the Lutz's home in Amityville, New York, during December 1975 and January 1976. Mr. Lutz's examination was conducted by Chris Gugas and Mrs. Lutz was examined by Michael Rice of this office. Both examiners reviewed a book written by Jay Anson which presented the Lutz's experiences during the period. Both subjects were then interviewed in depth by each examiner in order to make certain that each person understood each critical question to be asked on their examinations. <coughs> Excuse me. Following the initial pretest interview, stimulation tests were then given each subject in order to determine if they would be suitable subjects for the polygraph. Both examiners were satisfied with the results of their stimulation tests. Then the actual exam was undertaken. Uh, polygraph instruments were used which recorded blood pressure, heart rate, respiration, electrodermal re resistance. Both subjects were in good physical condition. The following critical questions were asked by, asked Mr. Lutz by Mr. Gugas. Are the details you gave me on your frightening experiences at the Amityville house true? The subject answered yes. When you fled your Amityville house, were you in fear of your life and the well-being of your family? The subject answered yes. After leaving Amityville, did you and Kathy both levitate at your mother-in-law's house? The subject answered yes. During your 28 days in Amityville, did you experience unexplained flies and disturbing odors on several occasions? The subject answered yes. At the Amityville house, did you hear what sounded like a marching band tuning up in the middle of the night? The subject answered yes. A total of four charts were made, which included irrelevant and control questions as standard procedure of the polygraph. It was noted that Mr. Lutz's blood pressure tracing revealed extra systolic heartbeats as a regular pattern throughout his exam. This does not affect his examination in the final evaluation. This condition is not unusual for persons with strong athletic participation. After reviewing the charts containing the above critical questions, it is the opinion of Mr. Gugas that Mr. George Lee Lutz answered truthfully to all of his critical questions asked in his examination. There's another one by uh, given to Kathleen Lutz that gives similar results. I can't, don't have time to read it. After Mr. Rice eva evaluated Mrs. Lutz's charts, it was his opinion that she answered truthfully to all the critical questions listed above and that no deception was indicated to any of those questions. Respectfully submitted Chris Gugas, Polygraph Examiner, member American Polygraph Association, Michael Rice, who did Mrs. Lutz, uh, Polygraph Examiner of the California Academy of Polygraph Science. This is a, a document, personal and confidential, that was uh, obtained by Ed and Lorraine Warren. So it's not a hoax. No, no way. On a scale of no, one no. to ten, we don't have Remember, much time. Remember, my offer still goes. Anybody out there says Amityville's a hoax, can prove it to me, come to me, I'll give you $3,000, the first person that comes right to me. There you have it. 3000 bucks. to anybody who can prove Amityville's a hoax. For Ed Warren, for Lorraine Warren, I'm Tony Spera. Thanks and good night. Good night. I think that uh, yeah, it's wrong. nobody's going to yeah.